Greetings, it's Charles the Historian here again, uh, and I'm right here, uh, back where I was at the last video, at the home of the Tampa Bay Buccaneers uh, and the site of the upcoming Super Bowl 55 at Raymond James Stadium. So this is the fourth video in the series on the development of football. So if you haven't seen the other videos, you should pause this one uh, and check them out in order so you can kind of get caught up. I'm a firm believer in chronological history so you can understand kind of where things get. But if you just wanted to watch this one because you're interested uh, in the subject matter, which we obviously have read uh, from the description, then, you know, by all means, uh, stick with it. So we started with a video about rugby and about how it was created and about how it spread to the United States. And then we learned about the legendary first game between Rutgers and Princeton, which is more like war soccer in 1869. In the last video, we follow the development through the Harvard and Yale game, uh, which is now known as the game, where the new rules were implemented, we'll say, of carrying the ball and tries and all of that stuff. You know, both teams wore specific uniforms and they played in front of a paying crowd of 2,000. And as we left off, there was a young man named Walter Camp uh, who was there watching the game and he's literally going to write the, write the book on football. Why more people don't know about Walter Camp is beyond my comprehension. You should just know his name if you love football. His name should be on more than just one trophy. and It should be on like everything, right? Uh, he should have an entire month dedicated to appreciating him. His birthday should be a national holiday if you're you know, a red-blooded, football-loving American. Uh, he was born about a half an hour's drive from the Yale campus in 1859, so uh, just right before the beginning of the Civil War. His name was Walter Chauncey Camp, and he was an athlete like through and through, played everything. Uh, he was 10 when Rutgers played in that legendary game. Um, I'm sure he didn't know anything about it. Um, and he would excel in any sport that he tried. Uh, and he loved watching Yale play when he could get away from his responsibilities. And soon he was ready to enroll in the Yale freshman class of 1876. And shortly before he officially enrolled in Yale, he paid 50 cents to watch that first ever rivalry game in 1875 between Harvard and Yale simply known as the game now, right? Uh, and it was at this game that Yale lost 4-0 that he saw the potential for developing it into something unique that the U.S. could, you know, eventually watch and the spectators would love it as well as the players. Once he was officially in Yale, he joined every varsity team that they had, as well as Skull and Bones, um, you know, but that's another story for another day. Uh, his freshman year, there was another conference for the football playing schools to codify the rules again and form the league. The last one, was held at the Fifth Avenue um, Hotel in 1873, if you remember, and Harvard didn't attend because they wanted to carry the ball. And the schools that were adopting the new rules said, we aren't gonna carry the ball, it's gonna be mostly soccer style stuff. Um, at 1876, when they had this, it was the centennial of the United States. And these same schools were gonna meet and adopt the Harvard set of rules which is more like rugby, which allowed carrying and scoring by tries, which is, you know, kind of like our modern touchdown. On November 23rd in 1876, Yale, Harvard, Princeton, and Columbia met at the Massasoit House in Springfield, Massachusetts, and they formed the Intercollegiate Football Association. Uh, but Camp's Yale team would not join until three years later because there was a dispute over how many players uh, would be allowed on the field. So they still had rules, but it was kind of like, well, we say you can have this and many, and you can have this many. Um, so to many, this considered the origin point of the creation of American football, since it was like the first real effort to create an organized standard football in America. So no matter what campus you're on, the rules would be the exact same, which opened up a lot of competition, right? So if you were on you know, this school, you could pretty much practice you know, one way. So Walter Camp had a few ideas, which we're gonna see are awesome, uh, that not only would separate the game from rugby, but certainly the association soccer, remember? Uh, association football, ASSOC, ASOC, soccer, that's where we get our term. Um, that people were still playing like a decade after the Rutgers-Princeton game. So here's a list of suggestions that he made um, that we can still see kind of today. So one, instead of 15 men on each side clogging up the field, it would be reduced to 11. Simple enough, right? More space. Uh, when a player is tackled, instead of like an instant scrum, like in rugby, the team that possessed the ball established a line of scrummage, or scrimmage, uh, which allowed for more strategy and kind of explosiveness and hits and things. Kind of gonna cause some problems for them a little bit later, we'll see. Um, number three, since teams got to keep the ball, there was a goal set for a distance. Um, for a while, you could just kind of keep going and going and going. Now, some teams would possess the ball, 
kind of like how some people used to with like basketball without a shot clock and they really wouldn't advance it so eventually that got changed because people got annoyed to where okay well we're going to give you just a few chances to get this many yards or else you're not going to you know keep the ball um uh, so anyway there was no limit and, you know before that so they decided to put a limit on it so that's one thing that can happen happen so and that you know nowadays makes for some super intense moments right that gives us the nice little yellow line that goes on the field that's you know let you know how far they need to get and then of course you know if the guy is right there on fourth and inches you know does he make it when they come out with the chain gang you know does he make it or is he short like that's all like that whole you know intense time that comes from this um, once the ground was placed on the ball seven men were going to be on the line of scrummage or scrimmage and four in the backfield. So that's where you start getting your modern sets, right? And he invented, uh, you know, uh, some of these things that we're going to see. The man in the center of the line would initiate play by snapping the ball back to the guy who was a quarter of the way back. Now that you've got a center, you have a guy who's a quarter of the way back, there's going to be a guy who's half of the way back, and a guy that's fully back, or a full back. And he came up with these positions also, as well as ends and other things. He also gave a point amount to the act of tackling opponent in their own end zone. Today that's a safety, but it was revolutionary. And it also kind of forced a team to try to advance it as quickly as possible without being attacked. So you could kind of hang back in your end zone, but you wanted to get out of there because if they tackled you in your end zone, now you're gonna give them points and embarrassingly enough, you'd have to kick the ball back to them. And that's why safeties, honestly, out of football, we all know it's the most humiliating play in all of football. If you get a safety, not only does the other team get two points, but you gotta give them the ball back. And that just, oh, that just eats at you. So, uh, and then scoring was another emphasis. So it changed the way the ball, uh, the points were being scored. And there's a lot of variations, but basically for a long time, it was, you know, different than what we were used to. Touchdowns were worth four, PATs were worth two, safeties were worth two, and then a field goal, a goal from the field, was worth five points. So kicking was still kind of the emphasis in a way, right? It was still kind of that whole thing. So it was still valued higher. So as you can see, um, he was a busy guy making a lot of great suggestions which transformed the game from mostly pure rugby to what it became. Another rule, which he did not implement, but it needs to be mentioned, um, is crucial distinguishing football from rugby, is what they called interference, which is modern day blocking. So in rugby, you can't directly block. You can get in the way, but you can't like pancake block. So no pouncy twins, guys. Um, like no, like, you know, getting in there and just smash blocking or pull blocking or none of that stuff. But when they started doing it, now you can kind of start getting, you know, different runs and things, and the game starts getting harder, and people are starting hitting more. Um, you know, and the fastest and roughest runners would be selected now, instead of just any guy before would just pick the ball up. Now, during this time, you could still be any guy and run with the ball, but now you started having specialized people that were specialized backs, right? Like you wanted the fastest guys to be in the back, and now you could have the strongest guys up front block for them. Now at this time, anybody played pretty much everything. There were still big guys and little guys, and everybody had their role. We loved to watch the big linemen run 50 yards for the touchdown back then, but it just wasn't novel. Players were relatively the same size. So, you know, it, things were kind of like different. So, but this is just the atmosphere in which this stuff by Walter Camp would be operating. Uh, he eventually graduated from Yale and got a real job working for the family business at the New Haven clock company. However, he did not stop thinking about or enjoying football. In fact, he began to coach and spread the gospel of football anywhere he could. He came up with his own American All-Star team, uh, which he continued to make every year until, he, until his death. In 1891, he was coaching at Yale, and he literally wrote the book called American Football by Walter Camp. And I'm going to post a link here in the description below if you wanted to actually read what he wrote. It's kind of like a who's who, but it also describes the positions and best things about football that he saw. It's a really good primary source. So, you know, I'm a historian. I think like a historian. I want to get back to like what did the guy actually say, and you can hear his words right out of his mouth, well, written on the page, I guess. Um, you know, this is important historiography, um, which is the study of history. Understanding how people viewed something is as important as the facts themselves. He saw the game as an extension of rugby back then, because that's what it was. Uh, when Yale favored, uh, favored this rugby style after playing Harvard uh, on that fateful day in November of 1875, before that, especially the Rutgers game, it was basically violent soccer. He also believed in lots of exercise and developed a regimen that would later be adopted by the U.S. military in World War I. Consisting basically of calisthenics, it was a blueprint for training for many of the early athletes of like a, the Olympic teams back then. Um, there was 12 basic ex exercises everyone can do without machines or any, any stuff. It's called the Daily Dozen. So we have to talk about his coaching career for a minute here because it's worth noting. 
Now, he was the coach of Yale from 1882 to 1892, and when he took the job um, for Stanford, he went all the way out there and developed the football out west. Uh, while he was at Yale, his record was 67 wins and two losses. That's amazing. And he went to Stanford, it's a fairly new university, and he went 12 and three. So, Walter Camp, the boy who watched the first The Game, where Harvard beat Yale using the new rugby rules, basically ended his career with one of the highest winning percentages of all time. That's absolutely nuts that he should be up there with like Nick Saban and all of those people. And he never looked back. He never stopped caring about the football game that he loved and breathed until his last breath, which he did in 1925. He made additions to the game that forever changed it. He saw the first real game and lived long enough to watch the Four Horsemen, the legendary Four Horsemen of Notre Dame, ride 1924 under the famous blue-gray sky. His rules changed the game from a wide open soccer style affair to a battle of three yards in a cloud of dust kind of gridiron game that became the sport of physical competition and military adjectives. We talk about the battles and the wars and things. That's where it kind of comes into. It wasn't a game to be played in vests and suspenders anymore. You had to have equipment for it. People were playing so hard and people were dying even to the point that this game was being outlawed on college campuses until a lover of all things manly and sports decided he would do something. He also just happened to be the president of the United States and he helped save America's game. In the next video, we're gonna look at the most crucial 1905 season and how the Rough Rider himself, Teddy Roosevelt, helped save football and how the sport got the last tweaks in which give us the modern game. So thank you for watching. If you liked the video, please let me know down in the comments. Like, subscribe, all those good things. Um, but check out my other videos in the series and then you know check out my other general history videos that I've made uh, on various subjects I got stuff about the Titanic and the birth of hip-hop and pirates and treasure and all kinds of other stuff and this channel is only going to continue to grow